Do you remember that when we talked about the when we talked about the moral rules, that the moral rules is what uh obey the law, so that you can sort of say what they think morality and 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 the law. And then we talked about two thousand five. Okay. So just to put things in perspective, um Medical negligence or medical malpractice is a subdivision of health law, and health law is more than respect to professionals and the institutions that deliver the money. Uh, so, if you want to think about, uh, the, uh, if you want to think about the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the law, uh, yeah, the medical the health law. Now, it's in the area of overlap between these two uh, enterprises. And so you can think of medical medical malpractice as just a single single star, if you will, in the healthcare universe. You see that these are all topics that one can talk about under the guise of talking about how to talk. So this is a quick field, uh, people who are specialized in professional practice have what to do, and they have to make sure that they keep within that, within that as a subset within that subset. We're going to focus again on liability. And we're actually going to focus on a particular type of liability. We're going to talk about negligence. We're going to talk about When we speak about other types of liability, for example, you could be liable to a patient who has been a deceptive or unfair trade practice. You could be liable to somebody that we'll talk about this case later. Uh, in contract, this is a great contract. Um, but we're, we're, we're interested in negligence, and negligence is, is a tort. And a tort, a tort is a, uh, a legal wrong that's committed upon a person or property of some another that is outside the scope of the contract. Okay? And we've already talked about. We, we talked about battery, right? And we talked about it more to the extent. We went to battery, uh, and that form is a potential for it, okay? But we're not talking about that today. We're talking about this. So we went from health law, to medical liability, and we finally get down to one particular type of medical liability, which is negative. Okay? Most people are going to do this, okay? It's useful to keep in mind Goals of the tort law. Remember, we talked about the goals of medicine, and that's that sort of helps frame uh, the discussion about you know, whether we should be involved in doing this or whether we should be involved in doing that. It's important to go back and think philosophically of what, is, what are the goals of medicine. The same thing applies to the law, but specifically the tort law, it aims to achieve uh, these ends. Both of them, it aims to compensate the victim of a negligent act so to compensate them for the harm that they have. Secondly, uh, the particular use of the aim is to get the gain retribution, which is basically the power of life. We want to compensate the victim, but we also want to make the person who perpetrated the wrong pay for that compensation. We don't want the compensation to come from the tax revenue to make everybody pay. If we want all the law to do the retribution as well. Alright? And then uh, the third thing is to keep the court law seeks to deter future acts of negligence, future wrongdoing. And it seeks to do that both generally and specifically. And what do I mean by generally and specifically? Well, by, by specifically, I mean if I commit an act of medical malpractice, I have to pay somebody to make them whole with us, okay? And I'm less likely to make the same mistake again. I'm specifically deterred from committing an act of negligence in the future. And if, if one of you guys reads about in the newspaper or whatever, you hear that I got sued by that pay judgment, you're less likely to make the same mistake again. So that's what the general deterrence is. General deterrence is aimed at the uh, all practitioners and specific deterrence 
aimed at the, the practitioner who was involved, uh, who might be involved in this kind of question. So these are things about the uh, goals of the court law. And by the way, if you think about it, uh, court law is different than, for example, the criminal law. And the criminal law seeks to do all the but if the criminal law does one other thing that the court law doesn't do, everybody know what that is? That's one goal that the court law doesn't do. You think about all the different bands that the criminal law has in it, all the tricks that it has in the bag, all the punishments that you can come up with. Can you think of anything that, that the, the uh, the law, the, uh, the criminal law does, uh, the court law does, uh, huh? Okay, yeah, jail time is, uh, 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 and we, we, we put people in jail, sometimes we, we put them in jail to punish them, but uh, oftentimes it's incapacitated. Okay, so we take them out of jail either for a while or permanently when we execute them, right? So incapacitation would be a goal of the criminal law, which is not a goal of the court. Let's talk about negligence. We have to hold it above that. We have to try to remember we define battery, but in this reference to battery, the unconsented to unconsented to intentional touching of another that's harmful or offensive. Okay, so negligence, negligence is conduct that falls below standard of care established by law. For the protection of others against an unreasonable risk of harm. The conduct that falls below the standard of care of the and law for the protection of others against an unreasonable risk of harm. And in order to prevail in a suit against a physician or physician assistant, patient or plaintiff has to establish four things. They have to prove these four things. And they have to prove them by a preponderance of the evidence. They have to prove it's more likely than not that each of these things is true. Okay? First of all, they have to prove that if they're doing you, they have to prove that you owe them a duty. Owe them a legal duty. Now, second, you reach that duty because you're part of so much of the standard of care. Third, they have to prove that they were damaged. And they have to prove that they were damaged in a way that the law protects them against. Okay? And then finally, they have to prove that your failure to meet the standard of care is what caused the damage. That your failure to meet the standard of care is what caused the damage. If you fail to meet the standard of care and they suffer damages, if there was no causal connection between what you did and the damages that they suffer, they are win. Okay? So what you did has to have caused the damages. All of those things have to be true. Okay? It's, yeah. It's true. You have to win. For the doctor to win, he only has to win on one of them. Okay? He only has to, has to win on one of them. For the patient to win, the patient has to prevail on all four. Well, it, it depends on the fact that the case was there, there, there's going to be difficulty establishing each of these uh, elements uh, in different cases. So, um, we'll see this. We're going to talk about the cases where the damage is established that you don't need to Coordination and dealing with each day and stuff like that, so you can prove standard of care, even duty. Uh, you can be thinking straightforward, but sometimes it's not. So uh, I can't say that one is only the hardest one. Okay, so this is, this is a painting uh, of Thomas Cole. I'm just going to 
and the rule becomes that you must exercise your day. Okay? So when one of these exceptions comes into play, then it's not the no duty to identify, but it's the duty of due care to identify. So let's talk about the exceptions to the no duty. Okay? The first exception is when there's a special relationship that is between two parties. Okay? And so for our purposes, it's the most important relationship. We're talking about medical malpractice, which is the doctor patient relationship, or the physician assistant patient relationship. And there's a doctor patient relationship, or physician assistant patient relationship, you cannot <coughs> uh, remain passive and argue that your passivity is shielded by the no duty. So, for example, if the patient's in your office, uh, your patient in your office, in the chair in front of you during my disaster and you fall through the whole thing. And you're like, I'm going to do something right now. I'm going to watch. And then, of course, the family sues you and says, hey, you can't do that. You know? And you defend by saying, hey, no duty. No duty, well, you know, I, I, I was passive. I say, well, that doesn't work because there's a special relationship. Okay? And so you owe a duty of due care to your patient. Now, that has to be a pre existing, that has to be a pre existing, existing opposition relationship. So, if there's no pre existing opposition relationship, okay, you don't owe, you don't owe that duty to everybody in the world, because everybody in the world is the same patient, right? So, you owe it to your patient, to your patient. Uh, and of course, there's other special relationships too. What are the special relationships between these names? What's the name? what's the what's the process? We think that people who are in that relationship owe something. They will do it because it's other people. Pilot. Huh? Pilot. Pilot? Pilot? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. The captain of the ship? Okay. Parent child. Parent child. Parent child. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, you are defined. Very good. Um, the second exception is that sometimes, yeah. yeah I, I think that I think that uh, I think that you still owe them a duty. Yeah. Um, because you can imagine it is. Scenario where there's a state made by the recognized by the state. Okay, you know what Okay, the second exception is that sometimes the law, the law creates a, a duty to act where there would be no duty to act in the absence of the law. So, an example of that is uh, the Vermont Legacy Statute. Uh, and basically, the Vermont Legacy Says, if you're in a situation to help somebody, and you can help them without any risk to yourself, uh, and you don't do it, then we're going to hold you these people to liable. Okay? If you think about what the Vermont is doing there, they are, what are they, what are they, like you say, what have we talked about with that down? Somebody else mentioned it before. Um, they're obligated to that. Yes, it's obligatory general beneficence. Remember, obligatory general beneficence? So, the Vermont, uh, the Vermont Medicine Act wants to make this about the state. Also, in the English League, it was the premise of the last Seinfeld episode. Remember, they went to jail when they didn't uh, help that guy with the card back. And he's uh, in a fictional town in Massachusetts called Latham, I think. So, uh, that would be another example of his success. Uh, and, and then, uh, apparently, uh, when Princess Diana uh, had a car accident in Hamilton Parish, uh, one of the doctors stopped him when they interviewed him. He came out in the interview that he had to stop. He was legally required by the French law to stop him from an accident where he was. That is another example of his success. So the law creates a legal act. So we can see that. The third example. 
say, I'm going to take the two QYC, the contract that you have in the hospital obligates you to be forward. Or working in the job, you don't have to see any of them. And this is also applied to the implementation of the policy, but the contract doesn't have to be a written contract, it should be a verbal contract. So if you're published with somebody, if you're informed and you're published with somebody, you can't just use the implementation. Okay? So far from being a system ethics problem, that's a legal problem. Um, there's two more exceptions, I'm going to talk about them separately in more detail. The fourth exception is that the, uh, sometimes there is a duty to act affirmatively when one voluntarily assumes the duty, we'll talk about like that. And then fifth, when the defendant is responsible for the plaintiff's peril or the situation that the victim has to be in, sometimes that's the case that we have to go to the court of appeal. So the first one, the fourth one, is Voluntary assumption. Okay? What's, what's this? What the rule is, is that once you voluntarily begin to surrender assistance, you must proceed with reasonable care. Okay? If you think about it, it makes perfect sense. What they're saying is, is that as you leave the world of passivity and enter the world of activity, the rule changes from no duty. To do care. It would be silly if, if that wasn't the case, right? So, so this is really, it's listed as an exception, but it's almost really not an exception. Right? Like, we, we, we need to think of it as an exception. Now, there is, as the slide makes clear, an exception to the exception. And those are the Good Samaritan laws. Good Samaritan law is The Good Samaritan law is basically a design to incentivize somebody who doesn't have a duty to render assistance, doesn't have a legal duty to render assistance, encourage them to render assistance. Okay? And so what the good math law says is that if you stop and render assistance under the circumstances uh, in which you are not legally responsible, uh, you are uh, obligated to do so, that the plaintiff cannot sue you for negligence, for one of the real measures. So it's an exception, it's an exception, it's designed to incentivize you to move from the world of activity to the world of activity. Okay? Everybody see that? Now, this is sometimes where the, the, um, the urban fiction comes from, that you can't stop thinking all of the stars. Right. Think about think about what, what it says is that once you become active, you must proceed with caution. Right? That's what it means in the resuscitation post for the rest of your life. Okay? It means that you can't leave the person worse off than they than they would have been when you when you can't do that. Okay. So one of the uh, great cases uh, that illustrates this is
second exception was the one which was defendant's responsibility. So uh, what this uh, exception says is that the defendant owes the duty of assistance if the plaintiff's danger or injury is the result of the defendant's conduct. The plaintiff's danger or injury is the result of the defendant's conduct. So um, let's, uh, if, if, uh, if somebody is drowning in a pool, okay, and I don't know that. I don't have to jump in and rescue them, okay? I want to go to the uh, Unless I push them in. If I push them in, now I've created a power. Okay, so now I, I, I may have to be able to jump in and rescue them. Okay? Now, there's, there's a, the rule has undergone change over time. Uh, in the old days, as illustrated by this case, uh, the rule applied only when the defendant's conduct was itself negligent. So what that means is like if I accidentally, if I tripped and pushed somebody into the pool, and they fell into the pool, under the old rule, I wouldn't have to rescue them. Okay? But if I did it intentionally, or if I, if I, um, if I threw a banana peel on the ground, and he slipped into the pool, that's negligent, right? Then, then that would be, uh, I would have a duty to rescue them. Yeah. Do you still do you still have an obligation to to uh to make reasonably under the circumstances? And if you if if this person ended up if that person ended up drowning, I think you would still be on you. Okay. Um so the example the case that only says if you need specific realm would be happier, you don't need to remember. The name of this case, it's just these are little cases that illustrate that you need to remember the, the theme, okay, the lesson. In this case, um, what happens is that somebody's walking on the track, standing in the back of the and uh, the train hit them, ran them over, killed them, whatever. And um, so uh, they, but they didn't stop. I don't know if he died right away or if he was just crawling away like that. So, you know, the, uh, they didn't stop for regular assistance. And so the, the family sued the railroad and said, you, you should have stopped at regular assistance. But the court said, no, um, the railroad was not negligent in hitting the guy. That was the crucial thing. Were, were you negligent in hitting the guy? And they said, no, because the guy was walking on the track. Well, the thing is, you know, if you're walking on the track, the train comes in and they walk one over. So since they were not negligent, the court said, you don't have to render it. Okay, so they, the, the railroad was one under the old rule, but under the new rule, it doesn't matter whether you're negligent or not. The new rule is whenever your activity harms the person, even if it's not negligent, you have to stop the regular. Okay, so at least that's why we have laws against even if it's their fault and not your fault that you hit them. Okay? Alright, any questions about the rule, about the no duty rule, about the, the general duty of due care with the act, the no duty rule if you don't act, or the exceptions to the, to the no duty rule, any of the exceptions? Is there a difference between the risk and the mouth? Yeah, I said before, again, it's not that small, but now it's like a thing that you need to act. The act itself is small. In this case, if you do an act that's not, not a bad act, but if you do it wrong, uh, and so, uh, but the, the, for our purposes, the distinction is quite important. What matters is the procedure part of it. If you're doing something, okay, then the rule, the act of the rule is, if you are inactive or passive, the rule is over the So, so in this situation, as well, where we have like positive bar and unintentionally, kind of by doing something with something. Is that again? Is that like positive bar and unintentionally, by doing something with something? In this situation, is that? Well, if, if we do something wrong, and it's and it's wrong. You could do something the wrong way and it's not going on, but if it does go on, then, then it's you know, just the same. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the confirmation of that fire, and this is the, the, uh, this is the, uh, the highlight, or the 
this question. The submission doesn't have to prove that he did the most doctors in the world. He didn't have to prove that he did what a respectable minority of physicians do in that. Okay, what does a respectable minority mean? Well, you have to look at the case law of all the different states to see what how each state has interpreted respectable minority. And the way that you the way that you prove that you met the standard of care that you did what is the customary medical practice is that you bring an expert in to testify that this is what the doctor and what we're doing. Okay. And the other side brings another expert in that says, oh yeah, we have to do it. Okay. And then the jury has to decide, well, do they do they give this consistency? Do they give that? Right. So you're, you're concerned about like uh, you're concerned about uh, evolution of the field and, and uh and projects and stuff like that. Uh so uh a couple of things. Um first of all the rules are gonna be different if you're talking about something like this as part of a research study, okay? And then consent is gonna be a big part of the getting around something like that. Um there is so some there is uh, some uh, there is some uh, flexibility and uh, patients are allowed to assume certain risks. Uh, and uh, if, if they're assuming a particular risk with full knowledge of what's going on, again, they're not consenting to that to a negative fact, they're just assuming a risk. Uh, so uh, we talked about that when we talked about the um, when we talked about modifying, remember we talked about using the, the, the terms reasoning and what to modify the terms of the obligation relationship. So remember we mentioned that uh, an allopath who is also a, a, a homeopath or an allopath or an acupuncturist that you could get the patient to consent to the treatment that is not allopathic and that would be valid or something. So I'm not sure if you can answer this question. But, uh, You know, a respectable minority uh, can be, can even be one person. A respectable minority, uh, if the argument is made the right way, can be one person. One person. Uh, and uh, although the rule is Okay, it's not an absolute rule. Again, really, if you get down to what the fundamental rule is, these two, it is these two ways reasonable to get this done. So, was it reasonable to do that procedure given the total state of medical knowledge? Is it reasonable to do that procedure under the circumstances? Okay, so let's talk about exceptions. Exceptions to the rule. Medical custom establishes the standard of care in medicine. Okay? So the first exception is not really an exception. It is the rule outside of medicine, and it is the coming of the rule in medicine. As the legal system goes away from uh, depending on medical custom to establish the standard of care, the reasonable physician standard. So, Remember the general rule that if you are dealing with a non medical case, is the defendant is named as an as a neutral, it's ordinarily prudent for the defendant to have behaved under the circumstances. So the the uh, comparable question in the medical medical case would be, did the physician behave as other reasonable physicians would have behaved under the circumstances? Okay? Without relying on custom. Okay? In other, in other words, instead of asking what a doctor usually do. That's what custom asks. What a doctor usually do, and assumes that the answer that spit out is a good answer. This question asks not what the doctor usually do, but what should they do. 
Okay? So this is one exception. This is becoming the rule. This is the direction that we're going. Instead of asking what is option we should be doing, what should the option be? What is a reasonable doctor to understand? That's one exception. We'll think about it as an exception. It's still becoming the rule. But it's becoming the rule. The second, the second uh, exception is that Okay, but, so I'll just you know, yeah. briefly, and then I'm going to talk about each of these in more detail. Sometimes the statute uh, can establish the standard of care. We'll talk about how that works. The third exception is that sometimes judgment can determine the standard of care. Sometimes the court intends to be exception to the rule of the Thank you. 
about and standard of care. Back then, the customary standard of care was you got to give me a blank, you can't be long, you can't be long, you can be long, you can't be right? That's the standard of care. And the remedy court said, well, the mom didn't like that. She said, they have to use the recommendation when they stop breathing. And the court said, well, that's what it says, that you have to determine whether uh, an emergency condition exists, and if it does, you need to stabilize. So, therefore, yes, you need to use the recommendation. Remember that? One way to look at that case, you can look at that case.
that was the point about this is the act, right? Because they would have to say, well, the defendant wins on the issue of standard of care, therefore the act must be dismissed. But the court didn't say that. The court said the following. The court said, Oh, 
Thank you. 